in the fabled land of Northern California. Nestled in the Valley of Sacramento, two friends begin a journey to enlighten the world about their experience living life as a Zenial. But what is a Zenial, you may ask? If you wish to know, then follow them on their adventures. And welcome to the Zenio Chronicles. This is James. This is Mike. And this week, we're going to do a part one episode talking about the first of two iconic comedy film directors. Okay. One of them was influential more so, I think, for the uh, Gen X crowd, even some of the boomers, seeing as he was a boomer. Yeah. Um, and well, still is. I still mean, he's is. still around, right? He is still, I, I think he's still alive. Yeah. I know his wife is no longer alive. Funny yeah. who he was married to when you consider uh, that he was kind of the top comedian of the day as far as film was concerned. Really? And who she was. You know who his wife was, right? No. And Bancroft. We're talking, of course, about a Mr. Melvin Kaminsky, <laughs> better known as Mel Brooks. Yes. And yes, his wife was Anne Bancroft, who's best known, I think, for... Um, the uh, Helen Keller movie, um, and then the black and white Helen Keller movie. Oh, I f- really? I, I forget. The Miracle Worker? Yeah, The Miracle Worker. Okay. I'm not familiar and with Anne Bancroft. I know the name. The Graduate. Oh. Yeah. Oh. She's the she's Mrs. Really? Robinson, yes. He was married to Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Damn. She's also in G.I. Jane, interestingly enough. She's the female senator who's trying to push through the uh, the initiative for Demi Moore's character to uh, to be in the SEAL program. Wow. That's that's her in her later years. Wow. But yeah, and, and Bancroft. Wow. That was his wife. I did not know that. That's, that's kinda, insane. It, it's just, it's not a pairing that you would think of. She's much more known for dramatic type roles. Definitely not known as uh, necessarily a comedic type person. And he was just comedic. Yeah. To the max. That's insane, dude. And so, so yeah, we're talking about Mel Brooks and kind of his comedic legend. I'm pretty sure he was an inspiration to the director we'll talk about in the second half. Yeah. That shall remain a mystery till the second half. But Mel Brooks now. Do you remember your introduction to him? Do you kind of remember the first Mel Brooks movie that, that you saw? Or at least the first time you really recognized Mel Brooks as a person? The first time I, as far as recognizing him as a person, I was able to recognize him as a person when I saw Robin Hood Men in Tights, but I went and saw that in the theater. Oh, you did? Yes. Lucky you. I saw that in the theater. Um, I think it was like 10. So you see, I, like I saw Prince of Thieves in the theater, but I did not see Men in Tights in the theater. I also saw Prince of Thieves in the theater. Okay. Um, but I, I saw that, but I... I Knew who Mel Brooks was probably, oh my goodness. Because that would have been- I recognized uh, who Mel Brooks was, and I was a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation at the time as a kid. Well, 93 is when when, um, Men in Tights came out. So that would have been right because I was born in 82, so I was 11. Yeah, would have been about Um, that time. Yeah. And and Next Generation was a summer film. Yeah. And TNG was big. So uh, I would say that. that Probably is the most frame. recognizable time was that, but I mean beforehand, I think I might have been introduced to like History of the World Part One. Oh, that's a great way to be introduced. Yeah, right. Um, I, but you know what? Everybody knows like the 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 main film that everybody really references to him probably is Spaceballs. Yeah, that's the that's, one that like he did other great films before that. Oh yeah. But Spaceballs put him on the map with multiple generations. Well, and Spaceballs would be the one that I can remember as kind of the first one that I hit, being the Star Wars fan that I am. Yeah, totally. You see Spaceballs, and it's like, this is, at the time, we're like, this is the perfect Star Wars parody ever. Of course, yeah. not so much, but still, well, st- really no, good. I, I would still consider it to be very valid in many different ways. In, in many aspects. different ways. I mean, Rick Moranis in that movie is, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Well, first, I wanted to go over kind of a little brief history of the movies that he's directed. A lot less than I actually thought. He's been an actor in a lot of movies, a yeah. lot recent, done a lot of voice work recently yes. with stuff. But I'm focusing more just on his directing talents his directing ability okay. because i think that really shows the truth of his full comedic you know yeah knowledge and talent art whatever however you want to put it yeah so the first uh feature film that he directed was actually the original producers with that's uh, the first film he did with zero mostel and gene wilder yeah that was his first Holy feature smokes. film and i mean if you really think about it it I know we talked earlier, you're a little more uh, um, familiar with the Matthew Broderick, Nathan Lane producers. I am more familiar only because I haven't. And I mean, you know, stone me if you have to. But well, the biggest, dif- the biggest I would difference say I, I haven't seen you. the original one. That's really. okay. I've seen a couple of passing scenes and it's a film that I always wanted to sit and watch. Yeah. But I never really got the chance to see it. I did 
with a roommate of mine uh, years ago watched the remake of The Producers with Uma Thurman and Nathan that's, Lane yeah, and Broderick. That's the, yeah, the, that's that one. Now, here's the fun thing about that one. Okay, in that one, they get the guy to play uh, Hitler, you know, the yeah. springtime in, in, in Germany, Hitler. And he plays Hitler as like super, super gay. Yes, it's super ridiculously gay. effeminate. And honestly, that take on it was really funny. Well, it was really funny. It, it was the original, because they were taking the they were taking the stereotypes of the time. Well, and, and the thing is, in the original, the in the, the original yeah. producers, they actually have the guy who does Hitler as a super hippie. Because it was made yes. in 1967, and so they flipped it. I think because the hippie thing. I think it was a more relatable sense. stereotype at the time, or something. Not yeah. that I'm trying to necessarily. And I'm not. I'm not getting into this. Like, don't get me. Don't get me wrong. Because this is really that the translation of of hippie Hitler as opposed to effeminate Hitler is at the time that that version of the producers came out. It made sense as the comedy. It made sense as the comedy. Whether um, or not it's a, it was acceptable comedy nowadays. Super, yeah. yeah, super stigmatizing still, but it made it was more relatable as a comedic take. Well, and I actually just recently started watching uh a Netflix special that was it's the comedy roast with Jeff Ross, yeah, but they're doing historical roasts. I've heard about things. this. A friend of, of mine them, told me about him, and they are, are okay. super offensive. Some of them are okay. But they are part offensive. of me is like, part of me is curious. Like, well, I they gotta did check a, them out. They did a World War II one, and when they were talking about World War II, he even says, you know, when we were talking about doing a World War II one, there was one person that stood out to do the roast, but we didn't want to make him the star of the show. So instead, we decided to roast Anne Frank. Well, they're really nice about it. They oh. do a co- no, actually, the, the how they deal with Anne Frank, they actually deal with Anne Frank really well, like in a more respectable manner. You would to say? her, yes, they were pretty respectful. They still make a few okay. jokes at her expense, but so they, it's like a roast of Adolf Hitler, but with Anne Frank's well, name on it the, instead. Uh, Adolf Hitler is one of the uh, people on the uh, dais who does stuff, and basically everybody attacks Adolf Hitler. There's uh, FD, there's FDR. He gets a few attacks at him. Oh, that's great. There's um, Don Rickles. So it's FDR, Don Rickles. And Hitler on the dais. Wait a minute. And then so, Jeff and Jeff wait, wait, wait. Ross. Hold Jeff on. Ross. Is, Don Rickles uh, is played by somebody else because didn't he just yes. pass? Don Rickles is actually played by his daughter. She is oh, amazing. My goodness, she's amazing. Well, and because uh, I'm assuming Rickles may have railed against Hitler at that time. Well, no, he was just a comedian of the time. Oh, okay. And he was in the well. He was a comedian after that. After having been in the military, he was actually in the military. In oh, he II. served. Oh, yeah. cool. So, um, his but his daughter came to came there to play him wearing a wearing a bald cap and everything. Just, oh, uh, she is hilarious. That's fantastic. It. But Rickles' wife. The the I think the funny part about it culturally is that everybody that's on that that's on the panel, Jeff Ross, the 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 comedian they have playing Anne Frank, FDR is played by John Lovitz. Really oh, that's well great. Done. And then so you have uh, I forget. What I know her Gottfried name. plays Hitler. God, Gilbert Gottfried plays Hitler. He's gonna slay and so, though. And so they have the whole the whole dais though is they're they're all of Jewish descent. Oh, every one of every wow, single one of them, including that's cool. And in fact, that's they, cool. they even make the, they even have Anne Frank make the joke that uh, she you know Hitler we got the loudest most annoying Jew ever to play you. Oh, with nice. Gilbert Godfrey and Godfrey, he goes up to do it, and it's totally in Gilbert Godfrey's and it's voice. Gilbert Godfrey. And he's offensive. He says offensive stuff, but like he's playing Hitler, so he's trying to say offensive stuff. Right, as he's Hitler trying would. to be, and that's the point. It's, and he's he cannot keep from laughing the whole time. It's actually really, really <laughs> Godfrey doing the humorous version of Hitler is so funny. That's fantastic. So funny. But anyway, yeah, I was going to say, about, isn't this um, about Mel Brooks? Damn well, it! Hey, he 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 was Jewish too. This is true, or he is Jewish. He's still alive. Um, so producers, his first film, yes. then a film called the 12 chairs, which I am not familiar with. Never heard of it. Was that something he was in or did he direct it? Uh, directed. These are all directed stuff. From, from did his. he write it as well? Um, I, I think he did again, just one I'm not familiar with. Cool. Never, never see, saw anything about it. Didn't, don't really know anything about it. Okay. I'm guessing it was comedy cause that's what he did. Okay, cool. Then you have made the coming out the same year. That was, that was 1970, by the way, the 12 chairs coming out both in 1974 made around the same time. Young Frankenstein. Okay. Sorry. Young Frankenstein <laughs> and Blazing Saddles. And there's actually an interesting connection between the two. Gene Wilder only signed on to do Blazing Saddles after they fired the original actor that played the uh, Waco kid for actually being a drunk. Funny Wait, enough. Who was supposed to play the Waco kid? I forget the name of the actor, but he, he showed up on set actually drunk. Oh, wow. And so he got fired. 
That's fine. Richard Pryor was originally supposed to play uh, Cleveland oh, Little's part. Oh, wow. The main part. He helped write most of it, but he didn't get the part. Wow. Did he just not get it? He auditioned there for it and not get it? There was some insurance issues. They weren't sure. The, the, uh, the studio wasn't sure that they were going to be able to feel comfortable insuring Richard Pryor he was to do that. So expensive? Because his habit was so expensive. <gasps> oh. This is when he was knee deep in the He drug was habit. right in the middle of that. Oh. Yeah, they didn't okay. want to deal with the issues revolving around that at that time. Yeah. Imagine how, I, I, you know. There's some, there's a lot more humor that Richard Pryor would have brought to the role, but at the same time, I think that Cleavon Little's kind of understated humor was just great for it. I think he was fantastic. You know? Where do white women at? Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Although Pryor would have been able to pull that line off, too. True. That would have been a good one for him. But the whole the whole, uh, the whole whole taking well, himself his... hostage scene, Yeah, I don't know. Pr- that, I don't know. I think Pryor would have overdone that. But anyway. Yeah, um, I could see that. I could Gene, see that. Gene Wilder agreed to come in halfway through the production of Blazing Saddles uh-huh. to play the part of the Waco kid as long as Mel Brooks helped make this movie that Young Frankenstein that Wilder wanted done Young Frankenstein because that was a passion project of Wilder oh yes big passion project did Brooks co-write it with him then um I don't know if Brooks made some tweaks and stuff on it but I mean there's a there's there's enough Mel Brooks style jokes in there yeah I mean you know nice knockers those that's (laughs) that's a Mel Brooks joke right there yeah um although some of the funniest jokes are actually uh um just stuff that they improved, like the Ovaltine joke. That was an improv. That's an improv. Yeah, that's funny. That's an improv, and that's I that's mean, even funnier that it's an improv. Yeah. Well, um, oh, Cloris Leachman is just a great, great improv actress. Oh, great yeah. actress to begin with. Everything that she does is hilarious. Yeah. And yeah, that was just an improv moment on her part. And then, funny enough, anybody that goes now to try to watch Young Frankenstein, anybody from the younger generations, yeah. especially the millennials that uh, saw their parents watch uh, Everybody Loves Raymond, yeah, they'll have a little Peter bit of a Boyle. shocker. Peter Boyle is so great as the monster. Peter He's Boyle amazing. was great in everything, man. I don't think I ever saw anything I didn't like Peter Boyle in. I mean, well, hey, he's even actually good in the Scooby-Doo movies. Yeah. The live action Scooby Doo movies. He's good now. Although I like Matthew Lillard in the live action Scooby Doo movies. Yes. He's hilarious in those. Well, he, he is, he dude, he so was good shaggy. enough to get the voiceover part. He is so shaggy for he's years. Great. But um, but yeah, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, probably two of his most iconic movies. Other than again, the Spaceballs, because everybody knows it. But those two movies are so iconic in the sense that they're not necessarily. I guess Young Frankenstein is a direct parody, but but then again, it's not. It's more of a uh, sequel. That, that's a parody, although they used, interestingly enough, the laboratory that they use in Young Frankenstein is the laboratory from the original Frankenstein movies. They, they, like, they got the, their the hands on the Universal set? Yes, those are the Universal sets. Whoa! Yeah, they're they're done on the, the laboratory. It's the Universal set laboratory. That's awesome! Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a neat little- I didn't little, know that. Yeah, that's a neat little addition to, to have on it, but it's more, again, it's more sequely than it is entirely parody. It's just a parody sequel. You know what I'm saying? I was going to say, because, well, it's not a direct he's parody supposed to be of the those. grandson? He's of the Victor grandson of, of Victor Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like denying the name and yeah, all the stuff that happened. He, he's and a Frankenstein, all this kind of stuff. not a Frankenstein. Yeah. And yet goes there and all these things happen. Right, right, right. Um, Great movie, though. Hilarious movie. Terry Garr, so great in that movie. Yeah. So great. Everybody is great in the movie. The Hump Joke. That was an accident. <laughs> that was literally an accident that it got moved at one point during, during between two shots, and they decided to make it a thing to move it all the time. And then they brought it back with the mole. Yes. <laughs> in, uh, in Men in Tights. Yes, they did. They did. <laughs> um, so then you get Silent Movie. Which is another one I haven't. I forgot seen, about Silent Movie. But yes, and it's a Mar- and funny enough, it's a Marcel Marceau type movie, and yeah. he's in it. Yes. Amazing. Very good. Yeah, I, dude. Silent Movie is. I think I've only seen it once, and I saw it once as a kid. I I, I don't think I've seen it since. I, I've seen bits and pieces. I've not seen the whole. But thing. But I forgot Just that it. Silent Movie was like a Mel his, Brooks film. Yeah, I didn't know it was a Mel Brooks film. Then you and that was in seventy six and seventy seven. High Anxiety. And this is the one that is uh, this, this is the one that is seen. doing. I haven't seen, but I know it's a it's a parody of specifically Vertigo, the Alfred Hitchcock movie Vertigo. Oh, cool. Okay, but, but it's kind of a parody of those type of movies. Any those type of uh, at that point the '70s psychological kind of thrillers, which Vertigo would fall into then, not now. Dude, that guy's but, like been that guy was on the pulse every single film he made. He was, and then you have. Now, Spaceballs was my introduction, 
But my favorite when I was a kid, I love Blazing Saddles. I love so many scenes from that. It's so funny, especially yeah. because my father so into Westerns. So for this to be a humorous Western, the only other humorous Western I know is John Wayne's McClintock. And I mean, that one does not age well with all the misogyny involved. Right. Although some lines are just iconic from it. I still, there's still one or two lines. Great party. Where's the whiskey? Love doing that. <laughs> People look at you like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Great party, but no whiskey. We go home now. Nobody has any idea what we're talking about. <laughs> but anyway. Um, you have, okay, I've seen that film once. Yeah. It was at your house. Yeah. Like. So this is. 20, forever 20 ago. Years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago. <laughs> once uh, I've seen that film. I loved it when I saw it, you know, back on your VHS player in your apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I, have it, I have it on afterwards DVD now. we played mario party uh i, I, have I remember on, that night i have it on dvd now and cool. it's still it's still again if you take the misogyny aside it is a funny movie john wayne well, sings if you think about it Drunkenly actually you sings. keep the misogyny intact and it's more of a time period piece it at is that point. it is it is a period piece and i mean just there's some moments in that movie you know yeah and i am not intoxicated yet <laughs> it's such a good movie god such it's been a, forever so, since i've seen so it many, i barely remember anything so many from funny it. moments i remember the movie. weird like the big mud fight or something like the, that oh, the, the clay fight is amazing yes there's another fight where like there's these at first it's patrick wayne actually in in, a, in another part john wayne's son he's he's in he's in a part that where his character works for john wayne's character but they're not related in the movie right but he ends up getting in a fight with an, with another young man he wins the fight. Well, that young man's uncle comes and gets mad because that uh, Patrick Wayne's character kind of just was just a farmer, right? So he's not anybody of important social standing, right? So it hurts his family's social standing that one of his family was beaten up by this poor farmer, right? So the so the uncle is going to fight him. The uncle's just this big brute of a man with this little tiny voice, and he's <laughs> like, you know, I, I can't have this for my family. And John Wayne's character's all right, okay. It's going to be a fair fight, though. There's going to be none of this. And he elbows him in the gut, and the guy, you know, just reacts like, "Oh man, that hurts." And just, don't don't do any of that. Don't do any of this. Starts doing a bunch of things to the to the big uncle guy. Oh my goodness, to show it's where a his Looney weaknesses Tunes are. Thing. None to, of this or uh, yeah, this to show or where his, this to show where all of his weaknesses are. You yeah, know, and and he's the, the the uncle's complaining the whole time. He's dumb as dirt. The uncle guy is completely dumb. Right. Well. The, they says, okay, let's start the fight then. And Patrick Wayne's character just starts punching him in the face. And it, he punched him like three or four times. And he's just standing there. And then, he, then kind of shakes his head like he finally recognizes he's got hit. And he goes, hey. And then it hits him one time and <laughs> brings him straight to the ground. And it's like the whole time John Wayne's character's trying to show him, this is how you beat this big old dude. You just try to fight him. It ain't going to happen. Well, guess what? Kid didn't pay attention. Kid was oblivious and got his ass beat. Right. Hilarious moment. As we're watching, we're like, that's so funny. He's trying to show him what to do. And then you see the fight happen. And it's and then the, the, the dumb uncles, he fought me well. It's okay. He didn't do none of that stuff. We're all good now. And walks. <laughs> walks. I'm like, what the hell? That's a good time, I guess. That's, that, that's a happy time in, in our country. But um, anyway, that's that being the other great, in my opinion, Western comedy up yeah. until recently. Million Ways to Die in the West. That's a pretty funny damn movie. Haven't seen it yet. Want to. Oh, my gosh. Liam Neeson's, dude. Really? Liam Neeson's is the bad guy. He's yes. a bad guy cowboy. Yeah. With an Irish accent. Beautiful. He said he would only do it if he got to keep the Irish accent. Beautiful. Okay, he is amazing. Uh, Seth MacFarlane, I love it when he does anything live action. I can't stand his animation stuff. The stories in his animation stuff just don't pull me in. I get you. everything he does live action, the TV show he did, the the Star Trek parody TV show. Yeah, that's gotten approved for season three. That one's called The Orville. Yes, It's gotten approved good... for season three. Have you seen that? That show is... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My wife and I are big, avid watchers. Of that. Oh, God. It's so funny. Especially, it's it's so not a sci-fi series, but then it throws the sci-fi at you. And then it throws a message at you. Every single episode. And it's like, what the hell? And well, it's, just, it's, it's, it's perfect homage to Star Trek, especially TNG. Yeah. Any of those episodes, all of them, when you go back and watch them, even just... just let the cheese factor kind of go out the window when you're looking at the story. That's what Gene Roddenberry was doing yeah. since the original series. Oh, this is, I, 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 the Orville's been hilarious to watch. But, yeah, um, and it's, dude, the perfect amount of jokes in there that allows you to get sucked in and love the characters and still yeah. pay attention to the storyline and go, oh, wow, this actually is real. It has a message. Like, I, I'm curious if he does that with, with Ways to Die in the West, too, because he really is there's good. Some, there's some message stuff in there. Okay. I, I will say the people that are in that movie... yeah. So well cast. I mean, Giovanni Ribisi's character in that movie. Really? He's in it? Oh my God, he's amazing. 
Oh, cool. He is he is so amazing. There's Even a point the where worst he's, films with Giovanni Ribisi in him. Oh, he's just, I love him in no, all of those he's like, all of those films. He, he's like one of the highlights of this movie. So much. There are points where he's just his movement, his ability to move. Yeah. Him and Sam Rockwell, I love watching them do anything because they have a fluidity to their movement. Yeah. Again, Giovanni Ribisi, Sam Rockwell, you know Sam Rockwell. Yes. Yes. You know he was in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Yes. That's that's one of his first roles. Most people don't. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Um that's uh did you did you know that his um that his lines are in Easter egg specifically? What do you mean? Um Oh yeah, he, check out wait, the East this, check out yes. the East building on Lairdman Island. Yeah. Yes, he does he does Eastman and, and, and Eastman Laird and Laird all in one. Yeah. Yep. I remember that. Took me a second to know what you were talking yeah. about, but yes, I remember that. Um but yes, Giovanni Rubisi, great in the movie. Sarah Silverman is mm-hmm. in the movie. Amazing. Her nice. role in that is really, really good. Um Charlie Theron, I know, is in it. Charlie Theron's in it. Uh, she actually has a guest spot on the Orville, too. She cameos on one of the episodes. She does. Um, oh, God, I cannot think of her name right now. Uh, she was in Mamma Mia. She was in uh, She was in the second uh, Talking Teddy Bear movie. In Ted? The second one. She's the lawyer in the second one. The blonde. I cannot think of her name. She's also in, like, uh, Little Red Riding Hood movie or... Uh, it was called just Red Riding Hood. Uh, I've only seen the Amanda first Seyfried. Head. There we that go. That is Amanda Seyfried. I yes. was like Amanda something, but yes, Amanda Seyfried is in it, and then um, NPH, dude. Oh, cool. He's in and, it too. NPH is kind of a, a minor villain role as well. Cool. Very funny. Nice. You need to see that one. Anyway, Blazing Saddles, great. But <laughs> what I what I was leading to, we're coming You're back like to going Mel into detail of all these things that are not Mel Brooks films. We're going so back to far. Mel Brooks. We're going to talk about the film that came out in 1981. Okay. History of the World Part 1. Yes. Now, first of all, what a title for a movie. Yeah, it in, it insinuates a part 2. Which the movie is. end credits areas insinuates a part 2. Jews in space. Yeah. Yes. Jews in space, which I remembered cuz I saw history I saw the end of History of the World Part 1 after I saw Men in Tights. Yeah. And the similarity between the two songs, Juice in Space and Men in Tights, are literally like they're the same time Basically frame. They're, they're the practically same, the, the same melody. The same song, yeah. yeah. But the the moments in, in History the, of the World Part 1 are, and we're talking about good actors in, in Million Ways to Die in the West. Yeah. What about in History of the World Part 1? I mean, oh, yeah. you have you have Sid Caesar as the caveman in the beginning. Sid Caesar, most people would only, most people of our generation would only know Sid Caesar as the coach from the Grease movies. Oh, he's there. He's the football coach. Okay, but in the Boomer era, even the Gen X era, he was a well-known comedian. Well-known comedian. Oh, okay. A little bit blue at that time period. Yeah, but well-known comedian. Yeah. So Sid Caesar, for for anybody that was again Boomer watching it, that's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Gregory Hines, right. amazing. Um, oh, Gregory Hines was great. I'm trying to think of, of the different people. Oh, Madeline Kahn. Madeline Kahn was brilliant in anything she had. Like, well, she was brilliant in Blazing Saddles. Yeah, she was like, she's fantastic in Blazing Saddles. I uh, Actually, funny enough, uh, I just introduced uh, my wife to Clue the film. Oh, yes. That is a, such a great unsung film. The The promotion behind it, I didn't know that it was John Landis that had written and directed it as well. Yeah. Um, but, well, he co-wrote it and he directed it, but- the multiple ending thing and all that. Madeline Kahn has an ad lib scene in one of the endings. Oh, really? And it's that I didn't brilliant. Know. Yes, I'm gonna have to see that. Yeah, she plays. I believe she plays Mrs. White. Yeah, I think uh, so. dressed in all black. Funny enough. Yeah, but um, but she has an ad lib scene in one of them, and it's dude, it's fantastic. I I, I would have to see because the one of her more famous lines from uh from Blazing Saddles. Uh-huh. Uh huh. That is an ad libbed line. They actually did multiple versions of it. When she's cool. in when she's in her dressing room with uh, the sheriff in the dark, <laughs> and she's talking about the size of certain body parts. Yes, they did multiple versions of that because <laughs> they had to get one that would go past the censors, and every single one was an ad lib on her part. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah. yeah. So the one they they ended up with was the one where she sings at the end and all that. Yeah, that's fantastic. For for anybody who does not know that scene, go watch the movie because it's a lot of fun, and that scene is funny. That scene's hilarious. That scene is great. Um, it's, it's a little, it's a little racist, but the whole movie is. So if you're well, not prepared is, yeah. for that, yeah. <laughs> um, but history of the world part one, she has, a, she has a scene that has some similar connotation. I love the pre orgy scene. 
Oh. Where she's got all these guys lined up. They all drop trow. Right. And she's, oh. Yes. No, 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 no. Yes. Deciding to pick which one's going to be her partner for the uh, orgy. Yeah. Hilarious. So funny. Um, but then I like the, that. The Last Supper. The Last Supper in that movie, in History of Boy, the World. It's been so long since I've seen it. Okay, we're going to take a break here. And uh, when we come back, I will actually explain more about the Last Supper scene for you, sir, so that you, so you can get a little understanding of it. Oh, all right. And finish uh, the talk about History of the World Part 1. Cool. Y'all enjoy the break. Hey, friends, this is Mike from the Zennial Chronicles reminding you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Zencron, spelled X-E-N-C-H-R-O-N, to keep up to date on all things TXC. And please check out our official website, thezennialchronicles.com, or if that's too much to type, zencron.com. Thanks again for listening, and now, back to the show. The Last Supper, Mel Brooks plays, the uh, the whole time he plays a character called Comicus. He's supposed to be the first comedian. Yes. And so he's at the Last Supper, but he's a waiter because that's the only job he could get as a comedian, which is funny for right, anybody that's yeah. been in any part of the entertainment business. <laughs> right. But he's there doing the Last Supper and asking if people want more food, want more of this and that. And there's a break in, in his asking of things. And Jesus says, one of you here has betrayed me. And comic is the waiter. Judas, would you like something more to drink? <laughs> Just like, no, no, I'm okay. I'm just fine. Leave me alone. <laughs> and of course, he he ends up being in, there's, uh, for some reason or another, this is the Last Supper. They're all sitting on one side of the table. And at the other end of the room is Leonardo da Vinci, who was not alive he's, at the time when the Last Supper would have taken but place. But he's painting them. He's there painting them. And you have you end up with Comicus in the background of the painting holding a plate over Jesus' head to give that to give uh, the halo. halo oh, and he's standing there yes, in standing the there yeah, he's standing there in the in the so, painting. Yeah. So funny. And then of course you and then for some reason you jump from the Last Supper to the freaking Spanish Inquisition and French Revolution and stuff. Yeah. It's like really? Nothing else important happened? <laughs> From from what thirty two A D up until then, nothing else important happened. Yeah, that was. I mean, he's kind of right, but still. <laughs> no, I like the uh, I like the simple fact that when everything just starts crashing together at the end. Yeah, yeah. Every every continuity that was there throughout the entire film well, just like falls apart. I mean, that's this kind it's of like beauty. a hole in the universe opened up. Yeah. There was a wormhole and just. Everything that, crashes that, that's together. That's so much the beauty of, of Blazing Saddles. The ending on Blazing Saddles is so fourth wall breaking. So, oh yeah, again, so meta before meta ever existed as yeah. a terminology. The whole just breaking through the set into the set into another set where Dom DeLuise is directing an old school uh, song and dance routine with with people <laughs> swimming in little pools and <laughs> dancing around in in, uh, in top hats and whatnot, and then it spills over to, into the whole studio lot into the cafeteria of the studio <laughs> there is a hitler in the cafeteria by the way oh the there studio. is i gotta yes. go back and see it again and then you get the two leads leave the studio ride horses the bad guy also leave the studio get in a car and they go to the movie theater to watch the movie being played at the movie theater yes I, wow i mean just the brain that he was working with back in the 70s. Yeah, the self-referential and, wow. and all that. Just so, ridiculous. after History of the World, we get our Spaceballs. Beautiful Spaceballs. Yes. Such a great movie. Oh, yes. that's um, And that's honestly, like, that's what I was saying. Like, the Spaceballs is like the cultural... Uh, I mean, that's the one that made that I would say Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein and all of our parents loved those films. Yes. Spaceballs was the one that was the one that put him on the map for like multiple generations. And, and probably and probably made it for our parents to be like, they like Mel Brooks too. They're my kid. I love my right? kid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And and it's such a great parody. It they, was a bonding experience it was, for many parents. It was. Um they throw the, the some of the references are just amazing. Pizza the Hut, so funny. Oh yeah. Um the Max that Headroom. That was great. Like that was great special effects by the way. Yeah. That the the Ma the Max Headroom thing? Yeah. Yeah. Which again, something for Gen Xers and uh and uh Xennials, any of you millennials that don't know Max Headroom. Yeah, you're not going to Google it and find out. It was an interesting thing. You're going to realize, "Oh, wait, what was that uh what was it that was, guy that it was you mean that wasn't viral. an M&M video basically no, this, is what they're going this for." This is Max Headroom was viral videos before viral videos existed. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Syndicated viral videos. 
Yeah. I always thought that was America's Funniest Home Videos with syndicated viral videos. No, America's Funniest Home like Videos. That's, that's basically Vine before Vine without yeah, like intentional. For the most part. Yeah. For the most part. That was Epic Fails before Epic Fails. Yeah. It really, really was. I remember my I remember my I had a grandfather that did not like watching that because he didn't understand the humor and somebody getting hit in the balls. I do. It's funny. It's funny as hell. Yeah. Even when it happens to you sometimes, it's years oh, yeah. later, it's funny as hell. I can say I've had I've taken a baseball bat to the balls. Then I was not very funny. Now it's a it's a hilarious <laughs> story. It's funny as all get out. But okay. um continue. But yeah, Spaceballs, so many good references. Was that, in that. the last film he did? No, no. For no. a while? Uh well, well that it wasn't was in, the last last film, but Space I mean Balls like he had a huge 87. break, didn't he? Space Spaceballs is in eighty seven. So okay, from eighty one so to eighty seven really like... he had a little bit of a a little bit of okay, a Okay, so Spaceballs was eighty seven and then Men in Tights was Well, then we have one called Life Stinks. This is another one I am not familiar with. I'm not familiar with that one at all. Yeah, that's not one I've, I've really heard about or had much to do with. We're going to have to figure – we're going to have um, to have a look at that one. That's that's going to be – so at some point, we we need to watch Life Stinks, Silent Movie, and uh, The Twelve Chairs so that we can do a report back on on what those are. Holy smokes, there's three films we missed out on. Yes. wonder what happened. But then the next one we do have in 93, and that is – the Robin Hood Men in Tights. Yes, the ultimate parody of a current film at the time. Well, I, and what's funny is it doesn't just parody the Prince of Thieves yeah. Robin Hood. It parodies the old, uh, um, what's his name? Oh God, the swashbuckler actor. Uh, he was a New Zealander. I cannot think of his name. Actually, he wasn't even a New Zealander. He lived on another island, Tasmanian. He was he, he was Tasmanian. Oh, um, Errol Flynn. The arrow it, it, it parodies the Errol Flynn Robin Hood as well. Yeah, and that's I mean, for a long time the Errol Flynn was kind of the standard in Robin Hood. Yeah, and then you had Prince of Thieves, which is supposed to be the more modern update, and it was terrible casting. I uh, I have a question. Except for the villain, the only I think the only if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I think the only time I was ever familiar with Errol Flynn Robin Hood was actually a Looney Tunes cartoon where okay. he cameos in it. It Interesting. Is a life shot cameo. It was a Bugs Bunny cartoon that was parodying Robin Hood. It was not the Daffy Duck one, which is one of my favorite Looney Tunes bits the, ever. The Daffy Duck uh, Robin with, Hood is, yeah, is good. with with Porky Pig as Friar Tuck yeah. and like all that. Great. Except this one had to do with it was Bugs Bunny versus Elmer Fudd. It was one of those ones. Okay. And it ends with uh, it ends with Errol Flynn as Robin Hood, like. I think it's like they was was the Errol Flynn Robin Hood uh, was that a Warner production? It might. I have might want to look that up because that footage that they shot was actually used in like there was some footage they okay. shot specifically for it's, that cartoon, it's, it's, and it's I think possible. they were just like, I bet you Mel Blank went to the studio uh, and was like, "Hey guys, I, we got an opportunity. You're filming this just up, up the way. Can you guys shoot something for me real quick?" Or, and then we'll put it in just, a Bugs Bunny cartoon or and we'll co-release it. Or it's something that they just rotoscoped the animation on top of. Uh, you know, drew the animation. Well, it wasn't. Yeah, filming. it wasn't on top of it. No, it's just a single shot, and then it goes back to bugs. Like it was shot separately. So it could have just been taking something from the film itself. too. Could have been, but it was pre- it was pretty funny. But um, no, for a long time that was kind of the gold standard in in the Robin Hood movies. Errol Flynn was able to pull off the accent. Yeah, unlike other certain, Robin Hoods. Certain yes, unlike other Robin Hoods. Very good. <laughs> you did it even better than I did by by getting the line in there. Thank you. Um, but. That w- that had more of the swashbuckling el- element and the uh, and more of the fencing style sword fighting in it mm-hmm. than uh, than the Prince of Thieves version, which we're dealing with more probably more accurate, well, definitely more accurate Crusade era swords because yeah. that's the era it was set in was Crusade for sure. But um, you know more that was more of an attempt to make a gritty, more realistic version. And again, we got we got Alan Rickman out of that man. That was one of his first major. Film roles between that and Die Hard were like his first yeah. major film roles, yeah. and so thankful to have gotten Alan Rickman because damn, dude, the stuff that he was able to do, such a good actor. Yeah. The fact that at some, one point in his career he signed on to a comedy movie for the hell of it and totally blew the comedy movie away, even though he mainly did serious acting stuff and he had trained as a uh, Shakespearean actor for in, in theater before all of that. Yeah, he did. He did one major comedy movie and was freaking hilarious in the comedy movie. Absolutely inspired people in that movie to do better jobs. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But anyway, <laughs> um, but yeah, Robin Hood, uh, Men in Tight, so good, yeah, so funny. Bringing out, I mean, Dom DeLuise doing a Marlon Brando impersonation. He was good too. It's so funny, so funny. He was good. Like he was the right amount of parody to it. Yeah. Too. 
the li- the freaking lizard because of course the lizard is supposed to be a parody of the cat that that Brando has during that <laughs> wedding scene. Yeah, the cat literally walked in, walked on set, just and randomly, just and it? he just picked the cat up and started using the cat for the scene. Wow, just out of nowhere because that was Marlon Brando. While uh, while they made um, oh god, what's his name? Uh, I think his character was was Sonny in the uh in in the Godfather movies. Um, anyway, they made other people have to actually hold the, the his lines, Brando's lines, so yeah. that he could read off of the read off a piece of cardboard his lines because he refused to memorize lines at that time. That was, uh, well, that was he before he was like, using earpieces. Yeah, I was gonna say he had people like tape their lines yeah. to their chests mm-hmm. and stuff while they were before that, if they were facing away from camera, and so that, that was, he could just read the lines. That was before he started using the earpieces, which he used later in his career. Yeah, even later in his career. But um, but yeah, Dom DeLuise in that so many quotable lines in that movie so so many great characters they dave Chappelle, you mentioned him yeah. at one point when we were talking earlier today how that was really a, you said a kickoff for his career it was a breakout role it was a breakout role he was and he was super young he was like 22 when yeah. he did that you get you get uh you get chef from south park as his dad that was isaac hayes man. isaac hayes That's played isaac his hayes. dad you're right That's isaac hayes i mean you get uh again roger reese is the as the sheriff so amazing, great yeah. British actor. Yeah. Um, what's his name? Uh, Lewis. Uh, the who played uh, the prince. Oh, oh God. Uh, no, not not Jerry. <laughs> no, not Jerry. Um, I know who you're talking about. Anyway, again, amazing performance. Moving mole on his face. So yeah. funny. Tracy Ullman as she the, was the as, witch. As the witch. Oh, she was good. So good. What, what's your name? Latrine. Really? That's <laughs> heck of a name. Well, family changed it. What it used to be. Shit house. <laughs> so good. So funny. I touched it. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything in that movie is, is a great parody of, of all of the Robin Hoods. So the whole pointy hat and the tights and the yeah. boar scene, yeah. that's from the Errol Flynn Robin Hood. That's a parody oh, from that. Oh, okay. That's where you get the those pieces okay. of parody in. Man. But, I mean, and then Eric Allen Kramer. I can't even believe I'm not even thinking of Eric Allen Kramer. Who is he in? He plays the Little John in uh, in Men in Tights. Oh, cool. He was good, too. Well, he's that's that's an act that's been around for a long time. In the original Lou Ferrigno Hulk yeah. uh, TV show, Yeah, he played Thor. He did? Yes. But now fast forward to American Wedding, the third American Pie movie. Yeah. He's the guy that does the dance off with Stifler in the gay bar when they're looking for the wedding dress design. You're kidding That's me. That's Eric Allen Kramer. And then he also was on a TV show, uh, uh, Good Luck Charlie. Wow. For, for the Disney Channel. Disney Channel? I think Disney Channel. Uh, for like six or seven years as the dad on the show. Wow. Yeah. Boy, he's just been uh, he's been pretty active since, huh? All, all over the place. And cool. that's he's such a fun actor. The thing the the whole stick fighting thing where they have the normal sticks yeah. up, they end up with little tiny ones smacking each other's fingers like we used to do with pencils <laughs> yeah. back in uh grade school. So much fun. So that was uh that was ninety three. Now I move into the last movie that he made as a director. Now he's done a lot of voice work again, he's done a lot of other bits and pieces. I think some of his funniest voice work is the Hotel Transylvania movies. Adam Sandler's kind of, yeah. hey, I'm making movies with all of my friends again, but this time we're just going to be voices. Cool. So let's get everybody together that I know to do some voices, just like we did for the movie Grown Ups and Grown Ups 2, and I'll oh, write every movie I'm making now. Right. Um, He plays the original Dracula, Adam Sandler's character's dad. It's so perfect. It's, it's so beautiful. And he's got the heavy accent and everything yeah. doing a Transylvanian type thing. Oh. It's so good when you hear when you finally hear him speak. He, I don't think he comes out till he comes out in the second one because that's when they that's when uh, there's a little grandkid running around, Drax grandkid running around. Yeah, and he comes out to check out the new grandkid to see if the grandkid's a vampire or not. Right, and if he's not a vampire, he's basically going to eat the grandkid. <laughs> so yeah Do he, when you hear his voice it's like holy crap it's mel brooks that's hilarious adam sandler got mel brooks to play his dad that's fantastic how how, how much better could it get yeah but the last movie he made was dracula dead and loving it yes his his parody of all dracula stuff i think he tried to get 
again, this is another topical thing because Robin Hood Prince of Thieves comes out. He does Robin Hood Men in Tights. Bram Stoker's Dracula comes out with Gary Oldman, Keanu Reeves, my yes. writer, Anthony Hopkins. Um, my personal favorite Dracula movie ever. I can even overlook uh, Keanu Reeves, who I love in almost everything else, I can overlook him in this because so much of the rest of the cast is amazing. Yeah. Funny enough, guess who's in Dracula Dead and Loving It? Carrie Elwes, who played, uh, or not Dead and Loving It, Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Fr- Francis Ford Coppola's version. Yeah. Carrie Elwes is in that. And of yeah. course, he was Robin Hood and in, in, in Robin Hood Men in Texas. Right, 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 right. Funny, around the same time, he plays a comedic parody character. Which is almost a parody of an earlier character that he played, one of his breakout roles, mm-hmm. like the, the role in Princess Bride. Yeah. Um, and then he plays a very serious character in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Very yeah, fun. And I remember he was, that's the thing. It's like, I think Keanu Reeves is the only like dark spot on that entire film. On the, on the Bram Stoker's When it comes one. down to, yeah. yeah. When it comes down to that. I, well, I can't remember if they actually parody that. At why not a writer a little bit, but. I think she was, I think she was all right. She was pretty good. I mean, well, there's even, uh, but here's the thing. Even Keanu Reeves went out and said, I did not fit for this. I don't know why they they wanted me, somebody. Okay? He, basically, they wanted somebody young that would attract attention. Yeah, they, and, they and, were looking for him for the star power, and well, it just and, wasn't Anthony, compatible. Anthony Hopkins had done the one movie, The Silence of the Lambs, but he hadn't hit, hit that had hit big. But he had nothing else beyond that, and he was a supporting role, not a major role. Yeah. But then you have everybody else in there. Gary Oldman at that time had just had a bunch of small roles. Now he's freaking Gary Oldman. Yeah. But then he just had a bunch of small roles. Oh, dude. And there was nobody else in the cast that was a big enough draw. Mm-hmm. Although Tom Waits, that's all. That's that's kind of an amusing little side thing in the cast. That's right. He's Runfield. Yeah. Yes. Such a good little role for him. Yeah. And his voice, his voice is perfect for like yeah. the psychotic mania that that character has. Yes. But to Dracula Dead and Loving It. Um, I, I've only seen it a couple of times and it's been a long time since I've seen it. So it's not one that I have great memory of. The only things I really remember is Leslie Nielsen as Dracula. And it's just, I, I personally felt that at that point, Leslie Nielsen, while an amazing comedic gem of an actor that we were lucky to have, I felt he was just too oversaturated in the parody market at that point. He had done all the naked gun movies at that point. Yeah. He had done, uh, probably the, one of the best parodies ever. In airplane, yes. I well, mean, here's here's the thing about Leslie Nielsen, which I kind of like noticed as the wheels were as yeah. the, as the gears were turning. Um, that is the only role I had actually seen him in where he is very emotive. Like all of the rest of the parody films were very straight laced dragnet style. True. He was yes. deadpan the whole time. True, and that's kind of why it was funny. Uh, this film is the only one where he was outlandish. I get, and and maybe that's, that's maybe that's the thing that didn't work for me. Maybe that's oh, what it was. Oh, okay. Maybe it was just the because wrong... I I liked I liked that. I liked seeing him more than just deadpan. But seeing him I play Dracula too. like that that makes sense. Um, See, even I, I, even I the deadpan that... when he was trying to do the dramatic actor stuff when he was playing. Uh, I saw his audition for uh, was it Ben Hur? I think he wow. auditioned for Ben Hur at one point. He's going up against Heston. He was going Shoot. up against yeah. He I believe he auditioned for. No, wait, wait, wait. No. Okay, um, I was going to say Heston's Hesp- Heston's uh and the antagonist of that film. What was his name? Oh, Character's name. God, I don't know. He's actually playing that character and the guy who ended up playing that character was playing Heston's character in the audition that I saw. Ah, okay. But he was playing the counterpart and I can't remember the name right now. It's been forever. But yeah, it was either Cuz he was on wasn't wasn't Leslie Nielsen on the in the movie Forbidden Planet? I don't Back know. In the day? I, I think know. so. We'll do, we'll do some research and get back to you. Yeah, on we got to take a look at that. But, but seeing um, Leslie Nielsen as a redhead, which I had no idea he was a redhead, uh, and, and he's like he's like in his twenties. Actually, he's that makes sense if his hair is white, like the, if his hair is white, like it was later in life. It actually yeah. makes more sense that he's a redhead. Interesting. Redhead, redheads go to gray and then white very quickly in life. It's oh. part of the pigmentation. So guess what? You're screwed. Oh well, I ain't screwed, man. At least well, I'm gonna keep all my hair. The, the the beard, my beard, uh-huh. all the white that's in my beard, uh-huh. that's actually all red hair. Oh, funny. Yeah. Well, this is already this white. is already starting to this is already starting to go. The white. I'm getting I'm getting white in the sideburns and that's all right. If I grow the beard out, I got white patches all over the place. But yeah, that 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 kind of gives a uh, a history of you know the Mel Brooks films and kind of what he did, even a short number of films, the impact. That he had from his comedic styling, the, the this parody. I mean, we see parody stuff now 
all the time everywhere. We see even serious products parody themselves. I mean, there are moments in the Avengers Endgame movie, which recently has come out, where it parodies itself, minor ways, but it actually parodies the previous Avengers movies, the previous Marvel Cinematic Universe right. movies. But on, on a larger scale, there are, are actors and, and film groups that have uh, made their kind of mark by doing the parodies. The guys that do the epic movie uh, yeah. uh, parody stuff, the uh, Meet the Spartans, same yeah. group of guys. They've, they've got like six or seven different movies where they've been able to do this hardcore parodying style that, hey, they made money at it, man. They got multiple movies done by ma by doing this kind of stuff. It could just be half the reason why I haven't seen him or I don't just really wish to is because Mel Brooks isn't part of it. Well, and I just feel like there's a magic to his stuff, the way that he does it. Although I can also take a look at Kentucky Fried Movie and Airplane with full of jokes that just haven't well, aged well and still think those are funny. Well, but that was a specific comedy team that did those. Right, and that's not the comedy team that does this, but at least those two, like you've got the yeah. Mel, you got the Mel Brooks type, and then you have the the what team that did those the, guys. I forget their names. They had a, they had a specific name for the, yeah. the three guys that made those movies. The, another one of theirs that they did was Top Secret. Oh, okay, Val Top Kilmer. Secret Val and Kilmer. yeah, Top Secret, and well, they did the Naked Gun films too, didn't they? Um, yes, I think they did. I think that's Naked like Guns that was part movies. of it. Like, there's just there's plenty to parody in yes. these in these current times. Why the hell? And I hear that there's supposedly a comic book movie, um, like a parody comic. book Yeah, movie? like a parody comic book okay. movie. Okay, but the the, uh, but apparently the like these comedies they're just not even hitting. They're not well, even hitting at all. They're barely making a splash. I mean, I can say I I watch like uh. The one group that does the the epic movie Meet the Spartans. I watched the uh, the Vampire Suck their Twilight uh, parody oh, yeah. directly after watching some of the Twilight movies. How was it? It's well, I'd seen it before, but watching it again after, there's some moments that are really really funny, right? And then there are other moments where I think this is the difference between Mel Brooks and them. Yeah, Mel Brooks knew when to stop a joke. They just keep and going keep the, and keep the story going. Yeah, they just, they just get, play they, the joke too far to death. So they beat it. Yeah, they beat yeah. it dead. Basically, they, they yeah, it, and that's what I have been dissatisfied in. Like, I think the most recent one that I saw that I thought was funny, the most recent, and this is like twenty years old. Yeah, not another teen movie. That stuff was that one was pretty fun. Oh my god, so many and things it still was like that movie. The team that did not another teen movie was the same team that did scary movie. Yeah. Um. And I think part well, of it I was, will say the first scary movie, the first scary movie was really was good. Funny. But the problem with scary movie is they were making a comedic parody of a movie that was a highbrow parody. Oh, you're talking like Scream? Scream was a highbrow parody. Yeah, that was the of, point. Of and that's why I that's why if I if I say my favorite horror movie, it's the first Scream movie. Yeah. Because it's a highbrow parody of horror movies in general. Yeah, that makes then sense. Then to make a comedic parody of it. Eh, and, right. they, and Scary Movie wasn't just a comedic parody of Scream. It was also a comedic parody of I Know What You Did Last Summer, which was yeah, just a and terrible those movie. Are the, mo those are the first two that, yeah. I mean, I Know What You Did that Last Summer. was That wasn't a Craven film, was it? No. Uh, okay. Actually, interestingly That's, enough, that Wes was a Craven's, film that was. Wes Craven's last film, I believe, was uh, Scream 3. That was the last film he completed. Oh, wow. Well, that makes sense. I mean, he did oh, no, it, it wasn't specifically three. to. It was four. There was a fourth one? Yes, it was Scream 4. How bad was I believe the fourth that was one? Actually, really good. It goes full circle. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Full circle with, with well, not three Don't went full circle. Don't spoil it for four, me because I think I'm going to go watch more. it. No, four is pretty good. It's pretty good. Okay. The people that, the, I mean, if you know it, the actress who's, uh, one of the actresses in it, if you know who her family is, uh -huh. specifically if you know who her dad is, her character developments make total sense. Cool. But you have to know who her dad is because basically, Basically, he's one of those people. There's like five actors in it, it, that are going around right now that if you need somebody to play the devil right. or the bad guy in something, the really heinous bad guy, yeah, that's the guy that you pick to do it. Gotcha. And he's that guy. So um, coming to the end, Mel Brooks, uh, good number of films, very influential. Obviously, we love them. Your favorite, again, was what? My personal favorite is Blazing Saddles. Blazing Saddles? Yeah. Fantastic. And any specific reason why or did we cover it already? Uh. 
Not so much as 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 I would think. Um, the thing about Blazing Saddles to me, the reason why I like it so much is because it was so culturally important, especially at the time. This is a movie that was made in the mid seventies when when racism, as it still is, very apparent, was very very rampant. But you also had like the rise of the Black Panthers, and you had that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, it was, that was, it was going still on. a mu- it was a much more heated issue than even it is now. Yes. Um, the thing about it though is when you look at it again. It shows you a lot about racism as being an issue, especially dealing with someone that may not have been black, but understood what the repercussions of extreme racism was. Yeah. As he as he is Jewish, right? Yeah. Um that's looking looking at it in, in that lens, you notice and every bit of the and there's two types of people that like that film. Which I find really funny. The, you have people racist. that under yeah, you have racists that like the race jokes because they're racist and they think they're funny because they're racist. Yeah, and you have people that are culturally aware that like the race jokes because they're educating. Well, and I I think the one of the key scenes in the movie that really helps with the people that are of your second group. Yeah, is when they're having the town meeting. Yes, and the the town the, the town they're having a town meeting, and these this town's basically a bunch of racists that don't want a black sheriff, and don't want to have they're anything. They're saying to deal the with sheriff the, is near black sheriff. That okay? one there. Well, no, it's the meeting. It's the, even the meeting afterwards. When you mm-hmm. find out what the last name of all the people in the town is, what's the last name of the people in town? Do you remember? No, their last name is Johnson. Basically, what Mel Brooks wrote into there is the town is a bunch of people that are dicks. <laughs> <laughs> their last name johnson right 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 Because right, johnson right. definitely would have been slang for that at that time period right and so all these racist townspeople are just a bunch of dicks that's fantastic and don't quack me out on that one because they, they need to hear the word sorry <laughs> so but that's the point that's kind of the point that he's making is all these racist people are that because they're john they're all johnsons they're also all johnsons which means they're all inbred and stupid there's oh, so many different right, jokes because they involved all have the same that. last name. They all have the same last name. There's so many that's different funny. jokes involved in the town of, of to show that they're wrong for being racist. They're a bunch of inbred, terrible people. Until yeah. the sheriff, you know, whatever, watch the movie, get the whole story. But still, that's kind of the highbrow part of it. Is you have the race humor, you have these racist jokes, but they're being done by people that really aren't good people. What I really like about it too is it actually it's not it's it's much more socially uh, uh it's much more socially aware than people perceive it to be because it's not just there is obviously the black versus white mentality but there's also the rich versus poor mentality there is um quite a bit of that there's dude there's a lot going on there's there's even uh i don't know how familiar you are with uh with the phenomenon of the sambo personality um it's it's a thing that it's a thing that was used and done by black americans former slaves and slaves of that kind of happy-go-lucky a uh, black guy yeah. of that time period, former slave kind of yeah. thing, the smiling one, the one that they did all of the blackface shows about, the Al Jolson uh, style right. shows about at the time. And it was this, it was kind of a shield to protect them from the racism of the time, huh. that smiling face, that happy face. And you've seen, I just yeah. think about, you've seen depictions of this thing. Um, it shows the, how they use that, and culturally how it was being used or at least perceived to be used right when they're talking to the workers on the railroad track are talking to the various cowboy figures and right. then they're talking amongst themselves completely different attitude completely yeah. different way of doing it showing that they had to put on a different public face to protect themselves during uh, the the times of even more extreme racism yeah that makes uh, sense i mean really great Movie for so many social commentary. I, I applaud you. Good choice in movie. Thank you. Mine isn't as good. Mine's just the Robin Hood one, and that's just that's just <laughs> really literally... yeah. Okay, I am I am surprised because I figured it would be Spaceballs. No, it's the Robin Hood one. I love the Spaceballs movie. Don't don't get me wrong, but the Robin Hood one just because I feel as as you say a direct parody to a direct movie. Yeah, it does such a good job. And then I I admit I got a bit of a a, a love for Carrie Elwes as an actor. Um, oh yeah, the uh, Princess Bride is like one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, and so anything that Carrie always did after I saw him in Princess Bride, uh-huh. he's still he's still Wesley. He's still the hero. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's a simple reason. Nothing, sadly, nothing too major about it. Plus, uh, I think there's there's a lifesaver joke in that uh, in that movie where like 
the sheriff is dying because he's been stabbed, and the witch literally gives him like a wintergreen lifesaver <laughs> to save his life because it's a life saver. And when you have something that's like so, that, that sounds like a joke written by a six year old. But that's that's what's so <laughs> funny about it, and and it's it. it, it uh, since then, I've always had the idea of a joke of when somebody tells me, hey, you're a lifesaver. I always ask, what flavor? Oh, jeez. Just because, again, to me, that's a little funny joke. It's, a, it's a dad joke before a dad joke. Makes sense. But anyway, so that's kind of it for us on our discussion of Mel Brooks's movies. I hope you all learned something. Maybe you want to be interested in watching some of his movies. I know I did. Uh, that's, <laughs> you said you sound like an after TV <laughs> yeah. or after after school TV special or something like that. That's, that's what I was I going know. for. That's fantastic, <laughs> sir. Um, next week, next week we are going to be discussing the films of, I think maybe a spiritual successor in many ways to okay. to Mel Brooks. Um, uh, it kept kind of comedy going, not in the parody style, but at least kept comedy going for our generation. Yeah. And the Gen Xers, and that would be Mr. Kevin Smith. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah, it's going to be fun going through some of his films. There there are actually some I haven't seen. And I think more fun, what our favorite Kevin Smith films are, because I think there's going to be some surprises in, in, involved in that. Yeah. So where can people listen to us, Mr. Mike? Well, let's see here. You can check out our website, thezennialchronicles.com, or you can go to zencron.com, spelled X-E-N-C-H-R-O-N, if you don't want to type that much. Uh, also, as far as Zencron is concerned, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Zencron. You also can uh, check us out if you might be listening to us on YouTube right now. Um, if you are, hit the subscribe button for us and ring that bell so that you get notified every time we put out a podcast. We put out a podcast every week at, uh, what, 7 o'clock specific, 7 o'clock Pacific time. Pacific time. Pacific time on specific Thursdays. Time. Specific time. Very specific time. Specifically 7 o'clock Pacific time. On, ah, ha, ha, ha. Dude, you pulled that off. Yeah. I could not have done that. Um, yeah, that's uh, you'll see us. Uh, that's when our podcasts go out. If you just listen to us, which, I mean, our YouTube videos don't really have a lot of video. We'll be working on that. We'll be hopefully putting that in. But uh, you can listen to us as well. Uh, our podcasts are on Google Play. We're on, or Google Podcast, I think is Google what it Podcast, is. Google Podcast, yeah. Google Podcast. Uh, we're also on Spotify. We're also on TuneIn. And you can actually listen to the podcast directly on our websites at thezennialchronicles.com or zencron.com. Or download them onto whatever device that you have. You can download them as well. We still get counted when you download us, so, so that's cool. Thank you all for listening. Hope you enjoyed, and talk to you again next week. All right. You guys have a good one. Thank you for tuning in, friends. The journey continues next week.